So we are continuing this theme of facilitation of ITD. We're following the same format. We're going to have a speaker and a discussant and then open up for questions and, and discussion. So we should have plenty of time. We have 90 minutes now. And we are, this morning we talked about facilitation within institutions, facilitation of academic careers, facilitation of the research process. And this afternoon we're going to move on to facilitation of teaching. And we're very fortunate to have two very experienced ITD teachers with us. Christian Paul from ETH Zurich and Henry Converden from Lufana who I'm sure will be known to, to many of you here already. Uh, they've both been active members of the Intrepid Cost Action. So, Christian is going to talk about his experience of facilitating ITD within higher education at, at ETH Zurich. Uh, he's going to speak for about 25 minutes or so. Then there'll be a discussion from uh, Henrich. We'll then open up the floor to discussion. So, so I'm... Um how do I use the word facilitation here and what about experiences? I'm basically presenting what we do in teaching without much reflection, I have to say. And uh, the facilitation comes in because I think the, the important shift in teaching is that when you go for these courses, then you become a facilitator from a teacher to a facilitator. Your role changes. That's basically how facilitation, you, you facilitate a learning process with the students and among the students. And that's how it kind of turns how the facilitator comes in, right? Your, your role as a teacher changes completely. My plan is 25 minutes, uh, 10 minutes, the first 10 minutes more about general, what kind of teaching do we do at the different levels? And then the second part is going into one bachelor course, um, the whole year bachelor course tackling environmental problems. So our teaching, TD Lab. I mean, we are a small unit at ETH. Uh, we, within the Department of Environmental System Sciences. So that means we are in the sciences. This department has like 50 professors or so, 47. They're organized in six institutes from atmospheric physics to environmental policy to um, forest and landscape management, all kind of different institutes. So they are natural scientists. And we host two curricula. One is environmental sciences, 150 students a year. And the other one is agri agricultural sciences, that's 70 students a year. And we come out of the environmental science curriculum. And we have courses on all three levels, bachelor, master and PhD. Uh, bachelor level, that's in the environmental science uh, curriculum, a, a one year course with all the 150 students, 10 credits. On the master level, we have a case study. We, usually, we always have case studies. A case study that is, and the bachelor course that's like a mandatory. In a master's student, uh, course, they can, uh, it's an elective course, they can um, uh, elect it if they want. And then we have PhD postdoc education. <coughs> so I'll talk about the master course later. The, uh, sorry, the bachelor course. The master course, I think the concept behind that is how we address intern transdisciplinary research. We think of the students that they are now master students, so they know a bit of something of a specific um, discipline, interdiscipline, whatever field, <laughs> whatever. So they, they think of themselves as little experts. So we kind of address them as experts. We, that means we invite master students from the environmental sciences, from the different uh, majors, from the agricultural sciences, and then we include environmental engineers, um, so that they kind of think of themselves as an expert of a specific field, and then they have to co collaborate on whatever topic they choose. You know, we give the rough topic, and then they select subtopics within that. And in addition to this kind of case study where they work on a case in groups for a semester, we have courses, we offer courses that address specific inter- and transdisciplinary methods or sustainability assessment. Because very often they have to say why is your, in what sense is your project or your intervention making the work more sustainable? And so they have to do a sustainability assessment. Yeah, of their projects, of their interventions, yeah, basically. Yeah. And sometimes they come to the conclusion that this goes more in the direction of sustainability, sometimes not. And then they're very um, upset or, I don't know, frustrated. And then we tell them it doesn't matter whether it leads in the direction of sustainable development or not. It matters that you are clear about that point and what you mean by that. You know, that's... 
case studies on the master level, we, do, we try to do case studies at the same place over several years. You know, we call that real world labs or living labs or whatever. One of those case study areas are the Seychelles, <laughs> because one of our one of the three co-directors, we are three co-directors in the Transdisciplinarity Lab, has a long history with the Seychelles, so he knows quite a lot of people there in the government and wherever in the, in the press. And um, he addressed waste in the Seychelles two years ago, because they have a waste, they have tons of problems, also a waste problem. And the interesting thing is, uh, if you work for several years on the same real-world lab, then you can come back the year later or two years later and see what happened to all the things you proposed, right? Nothing, something, and then you can start to analyze why something happened or why not. And uh, on the right-hand side, you see the system we teach in. Perhaps you can't read it. Uh, it's a system where the teacher is kind of one component. The main component is the students that collaborate in groups. Most, cons con uh, most questions, answers, discussions are within the student groups. Um, some are with stakeholders, people from outside academia, and some are with us. And that all is around the case. And we are in the role of facilitators. Every other year we have a case study in, in Zurich, in the city of Zurich, in an area that's called uh, More Than Living, Miras Wohnen. That's a, a block in the city that is completely owned by housing corporations. A thousand living units or some uh, uh, units. And they're all, they have all kind of they usually come to us with a question. In that, in that year, it was about, you know, the integration of the different cultures within uh, this housing cooperation. And then the students and the lecturers uh, selected um, cooking as a food, as a topic that might connect to the integration and different cultures. And so they made a big party and food party that you see in the left side. And then they talked about using all kinds of parts of, <laughs> not for the vegan, all parts of the animals that are usually not used. You know, and tried to trigger a conversation about food and by that to, um, to promote integration between the different cultures within that community. That's the master level, right? So we use, we think of the students as having some knowledge on the content, methods, and they should use that knowledge to collaborate in groups of different master students to make whatever part of the world more sustainable. On the PhD level, we have PhD and postdoc level, we have two courses. One is uh, what we call Winter School Science Meets Practice. And that's basically, we open for all PhD students, we basically go to a very small city in Switzerland, Wieslikhofen, and then we ask the mayor of Wieslikhofen, uh, who is a farmer, at the first day to talk about the actual issues, challenges of Wieslikhof. And those might be the school is closing because they have too, many, too little, the number of um, uh, children is too, too uh, small to have an own school, or then it's that they have to fuse with other communities around them. So it's never climate change, it's never biodiversity, it's never, you name it. You know, not the academics, what we think are the problems, but the community's problems. And then the students have like two weeks time to um, do research on that topic and then to, to go into, in, uh, into the community to talk to people and then to plan an intervention, you know, that helps the community with this particular problem, to go a next step, you know. And I think that's where we come closest to, to teaching facilitation, because here they basically don't use, they are students of atmospheric physics, they know quite a lot about whatever small particle in the atmosphere, but they don't know nothing about community uh, fusion and amalgamation, right? So they have to use all the other skills they have, all the transferable skills, and they have a lot of, um, to work on their problem. That's science meets practice, and then we have for those students on the postdoc and PhD level that kind of have to do an inter or transdisciplinary PhD, you know? For those, we have a course on methods and theories and tools and case studies where we really go into the details of the literature and so that they get a, a feeling of where we are, that there is theory and that they are, you know, in a, in a good mood and think of themselves as inter- and transdisciplinary slide, so that they become a, <laughs> a member of the community, so to say. Okay, that's our teaching. So, bachelor course, we take them as experts of their 
uh, of their specific master, sorry, master course, a PhD course, either we do facilitation or we go for the theories and methods, and now to the bachelor course, which is the only, uh, which is the only mandatory course we have of all those that I presented to you. So the bachelor course is first year bachelor, they come to ETH from whatever school they were, and then in the first week they have to start to work in groups in the bachelor course. It's called Tackling Environmental Problems in English. In German it's called Umweltproblem lösen, which means solving environmental problems, which is a huge title, <laughs> but they like it. <laughs> they are environmental science students, right? So they think that's what we should do. And uh, our goal of the course, the overall goal, is that they learn how to address complex problems always and to, you know, to analyze them and also to suggest solutions to them always working in groups and always working in collaboration with stakeholders. So that's the rough outline. First semester is we just study one semester the case, whatever the case is. We take the time to, to go into the details. Between the semesters we have an intensive week, one week where they work hard bringing the different insights on the case together and then identifying a topic to work on. And then in the second semester they develop the measures to address the problem and then this is all mandatory and then if they like they can take a third semester where they really implement whatever measures they have developed you know. and they we, we teach them lots of methods I guess Henrik will like them <laughs> facts and figures uh, 150 students 10 uh, credit ECTS credit points uh, we grade that. You have to know that the first year at ETH, that's a kind of a selective year. So after the first year, they have um, all kind of examiner, physics, math, biology, whatever. And then they have this kind of course, which is completely different, but we grade that. And this grade is like uh, either you pass that exam and then you stay at ETH or you fail twice and then you're out. Which is uh, interesting to include such a course. That there was a lot of discussions whether that's possible, you know to have so many group work, that was the main discussion. We have three lecturers, more or less, part-time. We have 12 tutors, which uh, th these are students of the second and third year bachelor, and they work like 2,500 hours. That's all paid by ETH, so that's a lot of work. Facts and figures, we also, um, doesn't matter what the complicated thing is, the message is we also group students in the first week, they have to fill in a Belbin test, and then we, sort them into groups of six, so that um, um, uh, men and women are mixed. We have two-thirds women in, our, in the environmental sciences and one-third men. So that the languages are mixed, we have mostly German-speaking, but also French and Italian-speaking uh, people. And that the Belbin roles are mixed somehow. You know, that we don't have two super coordinators in one group, or two finisher or two activists or whatever, so we kind of balance it out. And the reason for balancing out is that we say, I don't know whether that's a good reason, but we say it should be fair because they're graded. You know, we should build fair groups. Because my observation was in the earlier years when I had groups with a lot of strong personalities, they would underperform, you know, they would kind of in inhibit each other. Okay, so we group them based on a building test. We have an advisory board. Uh, that decides about uh, what topic do we work on, what sub-questions do we work on. And there we include, usually, so that we have the different um, nor normative ideas. In our course we include somebody from an NGO, from the government, from industry, and from science, you know, because we are more facilitators. We are usually not the experts in the field. We have two students in that, we have tutors in that, and the lecturers. We meet the... Uh, we meet the we roughly meet every two months. So last year's topic was the recycling of uh, concrete, basically. And uh, I now just go through the semester and what we did with recycling of concrete. So in the first semester, the students, always four groups of six, had to address one of those topics. We said, these groups, you do the analysis of the substance flow analysis of recycling of concrete in Switzerland. Or you do an analysis of the laws. Or you do an analysis of who gains money out of that. Or of the technologies or of the material qualities that concrete has to have. 
And then uh, one of the students in, in, the, in the year before, he said, okay, that's all about recycling uh, concrete. We should have a group on the reuse of material, which, which means, you know, you take a window and put it to another, um, you take it out of one building and put it into the next. Or you take out a toilet and put it into another building. That's the reuse, but that is quantitatively very small. So we said, okay, let's build only one group about that. So that's what they do in the first semester. We teach them, the, the library people teach them how to research the web of science. You don't find a lot in the web of science about that. So we tell them how to address stakeholders, how to ask questions, and then they, we send them out to the world. To, uh, cr um, they create a lot of confusion in this world usually, <laughs> because they ask tons of questions to tons of people. And we also teach them how to, sci how to write a scientific report, um, this is what they have to do, to have to write a scientific report on one of those topics. Towards the end of the semester, we do a little conference. They either do a talk about the topic that they did research on, or they do a role play about the stakeholders and their uh, fights and conflicts. That's most fun, usually. That's the Federal Agency of Environment. <laughs> or they do a poster, right? I, I mean, we really... Uh, behave like if we would be in a real conference. <laughs> we really train them. And then they write this report. This report is not so long, it's 55,000 characters, six people working one semester, and then they have to boil that down to 55,000 characters. It's not a lot. We tell them you can have an appendix of 1,000 pages. We don't care, we don't read it. <laughs> but that's important for us also because we have to go through all these um, reports. We grade those reports. Always an external expert or a stakeholder reads all those reports and gives a grade for the content and we will give grades for scientific writing and uh, formal things and also for the content. That's the first semester. Then we do this intensive week where we combine, combine basically system thinking which is very typical to our uh, education in environmental sciences and design thinking, the Stanford whatever design thinking. And we combine that because the Stanford design thinking is very focused on one specific stakeholder and his or her needs. And the system thinking is like, oh, we look at the whole system. And so we try to combine both concepts or both ways to address environmental problems. That means in the first, in the first day, so that the groups, they did one of those analyses, the students, and then we mix the groups so that in every group we have one representative of one specific analysis. So now they are the experts, right, after one semester. <laughs> they have to kind of defend within the group whatever aspect they look at, the law or whatever it is. Then we let them draw rich pictures. This is soft systems methodology of Checkland. So they together draw a rich picture as a way of integrating the different uh, aspects or analysis. Then they have to identify insights within that rich picture. Then they have to identify the stakeholders th that are kind of... Um, concerned if you change something there in the system. Then they have to build a, a system model around that to identify active and passive, a very simple system model, active and passive variables, things where you could start to change the system. And then they brainstorm measures, they prototype measures, and then they present all that to us and to the stakeholders within one week. That's very intensive. It's a week that is completely, the first semester is basically driven by us as teachers. The intensive week is completely organized and driven by, um, by the tutors. Somehow it's blocked. That's one of the tutors. That's one of our classrooms. And uh, a pity the movie doesn't work. <laughs> so that would be a movie just showing the afternoon. And we have six such rooms. And in every room we have like four groups of six students working. We have two tutors that are running around, and if you would see the movie, it would be like me for 10 seconds, I would be in this room. <laughs> so it's completely tutor-driven, right? I, we do very, very few things. We do some input where we think, usually when we think, now we have to give one specific um, definition of a concept, because we will later on uh, do an examination about that, then we do, we do it in a presentation, right? So then we think if the tutors do that, it will be too heterogeneous. Mm -hmm. So that's how we decide, basically. But who are the tutors and the difference between the tutors and the teachers? 
Tutors are the students from the second and the third year of the bachelor, basically. That's the tutors, right? The teachers are like the three of us. Then at the end of that week, they prototype things. You know, that's this year's prototyping. It's about management of small rivers in Switzerland when climate change comes. So we have a huge, all kind of prototypes. Not only Lego, <laughs> but all kind of material. And then in the second semester, um, the students, basically on their own, in groups of six, uh, elaborate whatever measures they brainstormed in the, in the week between, or, or new measures, right? And whatever, I mean, this is like recycling of concrete is a huge topic, and then they self-select where in that system they want to do something. And that's very hard for environmental science students because they usually want to stay in the whole picture view. Five minutes, thank you. And now they have to zoom in, right? And the, the idea is that after three uh, weeks, they submit a project proposal to us, so they have to self-decide what they do with a plan of what they work on, who to contact in stakeholder terms. And then we give a feedback in this advisory group, and then they work on their own. And at the end, we have a market of measures where they present whatever they have. So this group wanted to make a, re a recycling bin for houses and to put that into the railway station. They said, okay, people should know that houses can be recycled. And this group, this is a price list of, uh, of one of the recycling of concrete uh, uh, industry representatives. And they wanted to make recycling concrete disappear from this price list because recycling concrete is cheaper but if you name it recycling concrete then the people won't buy it so they wanted to hide that in a footnote that's kind of the measures they have they're so small right but uh, i mean that's how it is and that's why they also have a system model so that they still have this kind of system model thing in their mind so how do we grade the students uh, we grade uh, the written document in the first semester and the kind of the measures they develop in the second semester. You see here that we include stakeholders in the grading. This is the a representative of the Federal Agency of Environment, you know, grading. This is one of the, of the two, uh, lecturers, and this is another representative of science. And uh, we, we just listen to them and then we grade them. And sometimes that's hard for the stakeholders because they're not used to grade. And then at the end we have an oral examination with the students just individually to check whatever they took with them over this year. We also do, and that's my last slide, I guess, peer-to-peer uh, -peer evaluation. So because in groups you always have this question, what do you do with the free riders? So this year we started to, to do a peer-to-peer -peer evaluation. That's like um, um, uh, one group, right, that every student evaluates every other student. Have they been present? Did they contribute to the discussion? Did they take uh, over responsibility? Did they contribute their own contribution? Were they flexible? These are kind of things we ask. And then depending on how bad or good somebody is, we go one grade or one, a half of a grade up or down um, with the group grade. Right. Some groups think that's fair. Some groups think that's unfair. Because all of a sudden they are Guilty if one member of the group has a better or worse grade. Okay, that's it. That's it. Sorry? Yes, they try all kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. And we change, we never tell them what kind of me mean value we take. We take different values. So that's kind of under constant development. Yes. So that was it. I'm sure there are going to be lots of very detailed questions because I'm fascinated by this grading process. But I'm going to ask you just to hold those questions in your mind for a few more minutes while I ask Henrik to come and give his response to this presentation. Many thanks. So um, we literally uh, are standing on the shoulders of giants at Leuphana because Daniel Lang is from ETH Zurich. So it's basically um, partly built on that what we do. And we have for that, I think, for better or worse, similar experience. Uh, it's always, as I said, for me, consolidating to see that uh, it's kind of the same effect. Where, where I would a little bit, uh, where I have a different experience is with the students in the master. This is where I want to start because it's 
it's, I think, related to disciplines. I liked it very much that you say you consider them as experts. Um, I'm sometimes, uh, I'm filmed now, I should be careful, I sometimes feel different. Because they have a lot of knowledge, they don't have any experience. And they confuse these two things a lot. And that is where with the bachelor folks, I can say that now since one of them is here, is for me often easier, especially from a methods perspective, you know, because you can get knowledge on climate change fairly quickly. You can know a lot about climate change in a few hours. A applying a method really takes time. You know, learning that really takes time. And this is where for us, the bachelor students in the transdisciplinary projects, because we have fairly similar projects, is sometimes easier. And they are so happy to not be in school anymore, but they are still open-minded. They haven't closed themselves down. You know? So this is one thing where we also we try to build that continuous track. I, I also see that. So we have one project focusing on Lüneburg, and there we, since years, I think eight years now, is, this is happening. And there you really build some momentum. And also with the group dynamics in itself. I had the challenge in, in one group, it was another course, but still there you had a lot of people from different nations. And we do the Belbin test, but I learned there I do the Belbin test as a reflexive tool because of intercultural competencies. And also how cultures are like different, fr differently framing that. So what I ultimately did is I did a Belbin test that was ultimately it was a Harry Potter test. It put you into one of the four houses from Harry Potter and then we had four groups of like five to six people each and that was a kind of like nice semi-random semi generator that built some identity and they were really very strongly, like very quickly with the houses. They are the Harry Potter generation, right? So it was like the Slytherin sitting next to the Gryffindor and being like, damn, when they answered something, you know? So it's for me, it's I think quite helpful to use these tools and where we, I think, are a little bit, I was surprised by the disciplines that you mentioned. It's probably good to have deep knowledge in certain things, but this is the first point that I really want to um, give to the discussion. Our students are often stuck, especially after the bachelor, because they have this broad versus deep. They always have this challenge, now I basically know a lot, so I know nothing. And I try to keep contact with all the people that I supervised, for instance, in the bachelor thesis, when they go into a master program that goes deep into a discipline. And I never heard of anyone who said it was worth it. Like afterwards, they always contact me and say, yeah, what's the mistake? Because you never get this light from heaven that tells you, oh, now I'm brilliant. You know, it's, so this broad versus deep is the first thing. The second thing is what I call the normative void. What I also heard a little bit from you, our students are often stuck in this responsibility. You know, the world is ending and like the ocean is rising, like all these bad things happen. And for them, this is a huge emotional burden. And in trying to solve these things, also trying to solve complexity, for them is very tough. It's, it's a really hard thing. And the third thing is, and there I think we have to see the larger development. We are now at the peak of the wave of the Bologna process. And I like this Bolognese that really created massive problems because the students have all the freedom to choose. And this is why I like how you tackle that with clear structures. Because my experience, as much as I dislike that as a teacher, is when you give them this freedom, they become stuck. Because they endlessly iterate and they can't decide. You know, and especially in transdisciplinary projects, we know it's sometimes tough decisions. You're not going to please 100% of the people. So it's really these three points for me, this broad versus deep, which relates to disciplines, I think, then this normative void, which is also connected to the ethics that we discussed before, and then the whole like, cultural setting. The Bologna process is one example, but the new bachelor students, they are more free. Because the societal burden that we have, like the new, our new bachelor students, they say, I don't have Facebook, I don't have Instagram, I have a life. You know, and, and like the current, for instance, master generation, for some of them, incredibly challenging. This is pretty tough. And I think in the whole debate that we have, there it's difficult to know, did we start that? Did that happen? Where does it come from? This is something underlying all these changes that we observe and discuss. And there, as, as I said, the structure that you give in your study program is, I think, is one really good way to approach that. Okay.